Okay, great. Well, thanks again for the invitation to speak with you all today. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a senior consultant at Biologics Consulting, and we work with a lot of early stage clients of all sizes, and we work on a lot of areas of preclinical development, and I'm going to take the next few minutes to share some of the topics we frequently cover, some of the questions we frequently get, and perhaps some of the, the pitfalls to consider as you move along in, in preclinical development. And so I think we could all agree that as you build your company from, you know, a small idea based around a, a couple of inventors or co-founders, you very rapidly will need to assemble quite a large team as you progress towards launching your first in human trials. And this is going to require a lot of new partnerships. I believe you heard already this morning about some financial partnerships, uh, fundraising. You'll need, of course, legal support as you file for patents and establish startup companies. Uh, one area where my group is particularly involved in is, is in early stage biotech startups. This is a time when you're going to need to assemble manufacturing experts, um, experts in farm talk studies, clinical key opinion leaders. And really, as you get towards uh, building your first submission, there's other, other folks from project management, the regulatory experts, writers, publishers, uh, and managers of your clinical trial. All that will need to come on board very rapidly. And uh, one thing that a lot of sponsors take advantage of is, is the use of consultants to fill in the gaps uh, of their team, particularly while they're still small and still raising money. Um, and this can be an area where you can get very experienced support to help uh, grow the value of your company. Now, the transition from academic research to preclinical development uh, really starts with, with study planning. And this is a really important area that's, that's very different from academic research in terms of how you plan studies and who the partners are involved uh, as you execute those studies. And I want to walk through a few examples as we go through this this afternoon. Um, I'll start just with a, a few quotes here, um, some common pitfalls, but these are uh, statements I've heard over the years uh, as sponsors are learning to understand how to interact with FDA and how to plan out what they need for a first in human clinical trial. One example is the statement that our work was already published in Nature, so the FDA should have everything they need in our papers. Um, so clearly I, I would advise against this approach. Um, Nature papers are, are very high value and very supportive of your product. But uh, publications alone are usually not sufficient to start a clinical trial, and it's important to understand the difference between study reports that go into a regulatory submission and publications that support the use of your product. Another example is to say, let's just wait and not plan on doing any more studies, and the FDA will tell us what we have to do. And this, again, is an approach I would strongly advise against. Um, because you will be able to get feedback from the FDA on your program along the way, but it's really up to sponsors to propose what they intend to do to support their clinical trial. So if you go to the FDA and say, we don't plan to do anything, we've done all the studies we think we need to do, oftentimes the feedback you get is not specific enough to fill in the gaps in your preclinical plan. FDA might ask for additional safety data, um, but they're not going to write a study protocol for you or they're not going to define all the endpoints for you. This is something that needs to be done by the preclinical development team. Another quote uh, might be to just skip the pre-IND meeting because if we meet with the FDA in advance, they'll make us do a bunch of studies we don't want to do. Um, now, maybe this is uh, less common these days, but certainly I've heard this before. And again, I would like to dispel this myth because I, I do strongly believe that you will be held to the same standards whether or not you have a pre-IND meeting or not. So it's worth taking advantage of the pre-IND meeting to get the feedback you can as soon as, as early in, as possible in your process so you can avoid a clinical hold later on. Now, one of the biggest questions we often get asked when we first start working with early stage clients is, really, what studies do I need to put in my IND? And this is obviously not a very simple question to answer, so I just want to remind everyone that uh, each IND is product-specific, and even if you're 
uh, developing a product type that has been developed before, like a monoclonal antibody or a small molecule. That doesn't mean that the preclinical development path is uh, going to be exactly the same for every product. So this is just an example of some of the types of studies that need to go on prior to submitting your IND. I've divided it into manufacturing topics in yellow at the top, non-clinical farm tox uh, topics in the middle in orange, and clinical and regulatory at the bottom in green, although I would point out that regulatory really, you know, considering the regulatory impact of your studies uh, is the, con something to be considered by all disciplines. I have it at the bottom here because I also mentioned um, how to time out perhaps your meeting request for a pre-IND meeting or how long it takes to author your IND. So as you can see from this uh, development plan, there's a lot of overlapping functions. And so it's very difficult to um, maybe phone up a consultant and say, can you just uh, spell out the list of studies I need for my IND? It's really a partnership in which you need to work closely together and have both the scientific experts who've developed the product and the regulatory and product development planning experts who know the types of studies that are likely to be required by the, by the FDA. And this will help set you on a path where you can time out some of your key interactions, of course, your pre-IND meeting and your IND submission in this case. Now, another question we get often is, is when can we have our pre-IND meeting? What data do we need? Um, how do we know that we're going to be ready for our pre-IND meeting? Uh, and a major, you know, recommendation I would make is to wait until you've planned out the necessary studies you think are going to be necessary for your IND to start talking with um, experts and your investors about a pre-IND meeting. We often see sponsors arbitrarily set the date for a pre-IND meeting based on corporate goals or, or fundraising strategies. And while it's important to get FDA feedback to uh, show your investors that you've had a pre-IND meeting and you're on the right path, you really only get one shot and it's important not to rush into such a meeting. So I've listed some considerations here to think about in terms when you ask yourself, are you ready to go to the FDA to discuss your IND? So for pre-IND meetings specifically, I would suggest, you know, that you complete lead optimization. You have a single clinical candidate that you're ready to embark uh, on clinical development with. Uh, it's also important to understand that you've laid out all the steps for your manufacturing process. Oftentimes, sponsors are still in a stage where they are uh, developing manufacturing processes, and that's okay when you meet with the FDA, but you should have an idea of how you can make clinical grade material before you start meeting with the FDA uh, at the pre-IND stage. You also should have an idea of what pharmacology and toxicology studies are, plan are needed. So this is an area where, again, you can seek advice from experts to help plan those studies and understand what would be both appropriate as well as feasible for your product type and then present those plans to the FDA at a pre-IND. It's also important to understand what your plans are for the clinical trial. Uh, the patient population you're intending to target, the eligibility criteria, and perhaps even more importantly, how you plan to dose your product, the route of administration, the number of doses, the frequency of doses, combination with other therapies. These factors here at, at the bottom really highlight um, are going to impact your farm tox development and possibly even your manufacturing plans in terms of when you'll have material ready. And so it's important to really approach this from all three disciplines, but to not rush into a pre-IND meeting without having thought through some of these uh, uh, issues very carefully. And so these are questions that I think you can get answered and get support answering by reaching out to experts who have done this before. Once you're in the planning stage of your farm talk studies, my advice is to make a table of all the studies that you think will be needed in the IND. Now, this is something obviously you can't do on one slide, but we do often help clients develop farm talks uh, non-clinical package for their IND, and I've put four categories here at the top in terms of in vitro pharmacology studies, in vivo studies, maybe some pilot uh, PK or biodistribution studies, and, and toxicology. And as you plan out the list of studies here, I would recommend that you really consider the objectives, what model you're going to use, what, whether you're going to do this in-house or at a contract lab, uh, what type of compliance is going to be required, uh, 
what type of material would be necessary, and when you need to complete this study in terms of interacting with the FDA and filing your IND. And so I don't think I have time to go through every uh, particular scenario, but just as an example, your in vitro studies might be focused on binding or specificity with cell-based assays. These could be studies you do in-house in a non-GLP lab with res research-grade material. Uh, uh, pardon me, uh, and studies that you would be completing before meeting with the FDA. Uh, similarly, in vivo pharmacology studies might be focused on efficacy. You might use a rodent or non-rodent model of disease. You could do these in-house in a non-GLP fashion with research-grade material, and you'd probably also do those before meeting with FDA. Uh, as you move further along in preclinical development, though, you may be starting to do uh, studies to support the uh, justification of specific animal models, which would vary. You might be exploring how to do these studies with a CRO. The compliance may vary depending on whether you're doing uh, pivotal studies that support the safety of your product. And you may be moving closer and closer to developing clinical grade material or pilot material that's representative of your clinical trial material. Some of these studies would also likely be done before the pre-IND and should be discussed with regulatory experts in terms of what data and questions you need to discuss with FDA. Of course, your talk studies at the end of the process will be focused on safety. They may be used in healthy animals if you can show that it's a relevant species. They're likely to be done at CROs under GLP compliance if possible, and you're probably going to wait until after the pre-IND meeting to conduct those studies. So building a table this, like this that's specific for your product will help you go to the FDA and present your non-clinical package in a way that can be evaluated with very helpful feedback in terms of each specific study and the overall amount of data that's going to be presented in your IND. Once you get to the step of actually executing IND enabling studies, we often get calls with questions about working with CROs and, and how to conduct studies that are at, uh, held to a higher level of scrutiny perhaps than academic research studies. So some of the things to consider uh, along these lines are who will write the protocol. And I, I put this here just to remind you that for an in vivo study, uh, having an IACUC approval is not the same as having a study protocol. IND enabling studies should have a protocol written in advance of the study and should document deviations to that protocol. It's also important to understand who will be the study director. This is important because you need to know who's going to write the formal study report. These are very different from manuscripts that you would write for publications, and oftentimes it's the responsibility of a study director to combine sub-reports. For example, if you outsource an assay to one CRO, but a different CRO does the in-life portion of your study, somebody needs to compile that data, interpret the data, and then be responsible for describing the conclusions of the study in the formal study report. We also get asked uh, pretty frequently which CRO should be used. That's something we help with a lot, a lot as well. And I would just uh, advise you to consider a wide range of CROs. Often, CROs will advertise that they can do all of the parts here listed above, so they can write the protocols, provide a study director, provide well-written reports. Um, but there may also be an opportunity to use one or more uh, combination of CROs to get your study done. And so you should consider the GLP of compliance that's required for your study, who's going to do test article characterization, what type of assay qualification might be needed, and really vet some of these CROs in terms of their experience with your product type. Because again, um, just specializing in talk studies doesn't mean that uh, anybody who's done a lot of talk studies would be the best for your particular product. So it's important to understand experience as well as uh, experience with uh, GLP compliance along the way. Uh, we get asked quite a bit about development costs, so I, you know, unfortunately would have to respond that it's, it's also very hard to call up a consultant and say, how much is a talk study going to cost? Um, I've listed some ranges here. You can see they range very widely, and oftentimes it's because of the species you're going to need to do your studies in, whether they are single-dose or repeat-dose studies. Um, 
you know, again, a talk study in, in non-human primates can easily approach a million dollars, whereas a small mouse study with uh, one or two study groups uh, or two or three study groups may be at the lower end of that range. So it's important to plan out your product-specific studies first before approaching the CROs so that you can understand exactly what you're asking the CROs to give you if you ask them for a quote for some of these preclinical development studies. And finally, I'll just go through a few issues of preclinical development that have come up over the years. I know I'm running a little short on time, but these can have uh, significant regulatory implications. So it's important to remember, again, when you're doing your preclinical studies, that they're done with the same product that you're going to use in the clinical trials, that you incorporate regulatory feedback in the study designs after you've had your pre-IND meeting, that if you have a change of formulation, either the buffer you're using or the temperature you're storing at your material, that you consider how whether you've used the same conditions in your animal studies. If you're doing pro using products that use genetic engineering, oftentimes we see sponsors change plasmids or coding sequence, and this can have a significant impact on what studies need to be uh, repeated, perhaps, in animals to show that, again, you're doing your farm talk studies with the same product that you intend to use in the clinical trial. Oftentimes, too, it's important to remember your assumptions and provide a supporting data when you're making statements to the FDA about species cross-reactivity, immune response, or the feasibility of doing repeat dosing in animals. And finally, the delivery device you use um, is also important and oftentimes comes up very late in the process because the approval or the compatibility of use for that product with your, your product um, may require additional data for review by the FDA. So I think I'm just about out of time, and I, I'd just like to remind you of the key players on the preclinical team. There's a lot of questions to answer as you develop these types of studies. So in addition to the core inventors and sponsors, you will need experts in preclinical development and manufacturing. You'll need to work closely with CROs. You'll need your financial and legal support. And don't forget to wait too late in the process to incorporate project managers and other regulatory writers and publishers. And I think my final thoughts here are really boiled down to just three points here. One is to start assembling, assembling your team early. Um, seek out experts with experience with your particular product type, including successful regulatory submissions. And then focus the teams around a singular product and a singular clinical trial. So build a team, have an experienced team, and focus your team on a single product. And then I really appreciate your attendance today. I look forward to our live question and answering session, and I will stop there. Thank you very much.